My name is Anne Porter and I'm the founder and CEO of Aussie Deaf Kids. We know that there is a world of possibilities for our children who are deaf or hard of hearing and it all begins at home. So our goal is to support families to foster the potential of their deaf children. And one way we do this is through building parent and family knowledge. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Lisa Nayland, who is presenting this webinar, We Are All Ears, Learning From Parents' Experiences About Hearing Aid Use in Their Young Children. Lisa joined the Shepherd Centre in 2008. She is a senior listening and spoken language specialist and a certified practicing speech pathologist. She moved to Israel in March last year, but still works past part-time for the Shepherd Centre as a mentor to therapists working towards their listening and spoken language certification. She graduated with an honours degree in speech and hearing therapy from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa in 1992 and in January 2023 she completed her Masters of Research degree in Applied Science at the University of Sydney. I want to thank you, Lisa, for your time and expertise, and um, over to you. Good evening, everybody, and um, thank you to Aussie Deaf Kids for um, inviting me to chat um, about my clinical experiences and my research around um, hearing aid use in young children. Um, we don't have a lot of time and being a speech therapist, I like to talk a lot. So I know that I'm um, very limited um, to no more than an hour. And I do want to dedicate a lot of this time to, um, you know, practical hands on advice um, and less on the theoretical foundations and the research. So with that in mind, I'm going to get started. Um, Tonight's webinar basically has four components. The first part is very brief, just a little bit of an more of an introduction about myself and the learning objectives for tonight. The second part, really just talking a bit about the, the research and the theoretical concepts behind hearing aids and hearing aid use. The third and most important part of this evening is talking about strategies and hands-on tips that will help to improve hearing aid use in your children and children with hearing loss. And finally, I'd like to leave some time at the end for um, questions and any um, informal discussion. Um, and uh, please feel free, you know, to put your questions in the chat if you like, or if you want to ask questions at the end. So um, thank you um, to Anne who gave um, such a lovely introduction about myself. So this will be really short. Really what I wanted to add here um, is more an acknowledgement that I'm a clinician who's worked with children with hearing loss for many years, but I'm not a parent who um, has a child with hearing loss. And while I am a parent, it's very different to parenting a child with hearing loss. And I really acknowledge and respect that. And I wanted, um, you know, just to mention it. Another thing I also want to mention is that tonight I'm going to be speaking about optimal hearing aid use to encourage the development of spoken language um, and hopefully age appropriate spoken language. So I'm very much coming from that lens. And I, again, I wanted to acknowledge that I know as parents, you might have chosen different communication options for your children. Um, you might be using a bilingual approach. Um, you might be focusing more on signing um, as opposed to speaking. So just, you know, acknowledging my respect for that. And um, at no point in time am I um, attempting to offend anyone. Um, and if I say anything that might be sensitive to you, it's um, really not intended, but just very much that I'm coming from that lens of building hearing aid use for the development of spoken language. Okay, so just um, a few learning objectives for tonight. Um, obviously, I will talk a little bit about the research around hearing aid use and the factors that may influence hearing aid use, both positive and negative factors. Um, I'd like to develop for you a greater understanding of what actually optimal hearing aid use looks like, because across the literature, it looks quite different. 
Um, I'd also like to briefly discuss and link communication and learning outcomes to hearing aid use factors. And then finally, and most importantly, I'd like to discuss and brainstorm strategies for building optimal hearing aid use. So um, without further ado, just talking a little bit about the theory and research around hearing aid use and hearing aids. So um, firstly, we know that hearing aids provide a pathway for all the sounds in the child's environment to reach the auditory centers of the brain. And thus very much hearing aids are seen to be the doorways or the gateways, according to Colin Flexer, um, to the brain. And we actually hear with our brain and not with our ears. Uh, sorry, just trying to get to the next slide. Um, sorry, it seems to be stuck. Let's have a look. There you go. Okay, so um, what I wanted to say here is I wanted to link a child's speech and language outcomes to some hearing aid factors. And um, what we know from the research is that there are a number of hearing aid factors that actually are, are well linked to age appropriate um, childhood outcomes in the area of listening, speech and language. And um, these factors include the earlier fitting of hearing aids, and people like Ching and Lee have done a lot of work in that area. We also know that when children use their hearing aids for a greater number of hours, this is also linked to better outcomes. And we also know that the quality of the hearing aid fit um, is also linked to those better outcomes. When we have all these hearing aid factors, <clears throat> and um, in addition to that, we have expo a child has exposure to abundant and high quality spoken language, then we know that we can enhance the child's outcomes. Um, and especially when this is occurring in the first few years of life, usually the first three and a half years of life, where um, a child's um, auditory brain senses and their brain in general is much more neuroplastic to learning new things and um, experiencing new stimuli. So um, if we can pair up all these hearing aid factors with a really good listening environment and great exposure to spoken language models, um, then we're really setting up the child for success. What does it actually mean when a child has poor access to sound? So we know that um, obviously if a child has a hearing loss, then um, they're not gonna have optimal access to the sounds in their environment. Um, but poor access is not only about hearing loss. Poor access to sound is also about their hearing aid technology. So when a child is not using their hearing aid technology or is not using their hearing aid technology consistently, or when the hearing aids are not working properly, then um, we can assume that um, the child is going to have poor access to sound. Um, I really love this quote by Seninga who um, said that, Decreased auditory sensitivity that manifests in early life can adversely affect a child's communicative and cognitive development, as well as their educational progress. Um, and I think she really summed this up beautifully that um, there's such an impact of poor access to sound and it's so far reaching and there is so much at stake. And with that in mind, um, you know, I've just kind of mentioned quite a few areas or domains in a child's development that are at stake when hearing um, access to sound is not optimal and um, we're not actually managing the child's hearing loss. Um, I won't go into detail just because of time constraints, but you can see from the slide that um, you know poor access or suboptimal access is so far reaching. Um, 
not only on a child's communication outcomes like speech and language and listening, but also on literacy and cognition and critical thinking and on executive functioning, social skills, social emotional skills, pragmatic skills. So um, really just wanted to capture in this slide just how far reaching um, poor access to sound can be. I really love this slide and, and wanted to share it with you. Um, it's not based on any of my original work. It's actually from the Hearing Health Matters website. And I just love it because it shows how integral listening is in the context of life and how much we, we need listening to develop um, in every domain of life as well. So I'm not going to go into detail with every um, point on the slide. Um, I will talk about that typical hearing aid children with hear typical hearing um, can hear 24 hours of the day, even when they're sleeping. And we don't actually have earlids the way we have eyelids. So we can't shut out um, things that we, we don't want to hear. We can filter them out to a certain extent but we are always hearing. And we want that for children with hearing loss too. We also know that when children with hearing loss's technology is not working optimally, they're not going to be hearing well. They are going to be hearing, but they're not going to be hearing well and optimally. Um, I really like the quote at the bottom of, from Karen Anderson, who said, language is caught and not taught. And really, we want that for our children with our hearing, with hearing loss, that most of the language that children learn is picked up from earshot listening, from distance hearing around them. And we want our children with hearing loss through their technology to have the same potential and have the same opportunity to be able to to catch language that way. I also briefly wanted to chat to you about optimal hearing aid use and what this looks like, because when I was doing my studies, I found that there was such a variety and such a spectrum of what this actually looked like. Um, someone like Walker et al, for example, in their study found that optimal hearing aid use was around 8.7 hours per day. Whereas um, experts in the field like Caraway and Ambrose, they both said that children must be using their technology for at least 10 hours of the day. I also came across certain phrases like um, all waking hours or eyes open, ears on um, to describe what optimal hearing aid use was all about. Or sometimes it's quantified in terms of a percentage. So in a study by Monane and Ching, they said that optimal or consistent hearing aid use was, um, was when a child was using their hearing aids for 75% of the day. So you can see there's quite a, a range of how we actually qualify and quantify what consistent hearing aid use is. And of course, it's going to differ um, according to, you know, the age of the child. So obviously, um, you know, a very newborn child who's sleeping a lot isn't going to have as much wear time as an older child who's awake for most of the day. So um, we know this. So we've kind of moved out of the theory and a little bit into the research now. So we know all of these factors. We know that um, children need to wear their hearing aids as optimally as possible. Um, we know that their hearing aids need to be working as well as possibly possible. And yet what I've seen in clinical practice for at least the last 15 years was that that's not always the reality and that um, children at some point in time really struggle um, with wearing their hearing aids for an optimal amount of time due to a range of factors. Um, and this really motivated me and informed me to move a little bit into the research on, you know, what was actually, what were these factors um, that are, are causing children not to wear their hearing, hearing aids? And are we seeing it globally? Is it specific to certain places? Um, so this led to my first research study 
which was entitled in identifying the factors that affect consistent hearing aid use in young children um, with early identified hearing loss. And a scoping review, what it does, it spans all the literature um, according to certain inclusion criteria, and it looks for papers that address um, the factors that affect hearing aid use in young children. Again, due to time restraints, I'm not going to bore you with too much of the research um, details and information. But what I did is I found that there were 25 journal articles that actually met my criteria between the, the years of 1999 to 2019, because I wanted them to be, um, you know, as recent as possible. And I analyzed the journal articles using what's called thematic analysis. And I found four global themes um, across the world literature, which related to factors that um, will influence hearing aid use in children. As you can see, the four global themes are represented in the slide. And um, the middle two are themes that are surrounded around parents. And this isn't to say that, you know, problems with hearing aid use is a parent issue. That's not at all. But um, I will go into each one and just explain um, a little bit about what I found. So in the first global theme, which was each child is an individual, I'll take an example. One of my sub themes that was found across the uh, literature was age and stage of development, which found that when children are a certain age or at certain stages in their development, what happens is that hearing aid use either drops off or improves. And um, I'm sure this is resonating with a lot of the parents who are listening today. Um, in to give you an example of the next global theme, parents are key. Um, one of the sub themes was social economic status or advantage. And when we measured this um, based on maternal education, we found that um, children whose parents had a higher maternal education, um, there seemed to be a link to a greater number of hearing aid use hours. The third global theme, parents require support. Um, I'm going to take the example of device management for, as a, a sub theme. And what we found was that um, the ease at which parents um, can take care of and troubleshoot their child's devices seem to influence hearing aid use as well. And then the final global theme, professionals make a difference. Um, there were four sub themes under this global theme. And for example, we found that the type of service delivery that parents receive from professionals may influence um, you know, the uptake of hearing aids as well as how often the hearing, aid you, hearing aids are being worn. So as you can see from the previous slide, there were a lot of factors around parents. And this really got me thinking, um, not only based, based on what I was seeing clinically with while working with um, children and, and their parents or their caregivers, um, but also what I was seeing in the literature was that, you know, there's so many parent factors, but nobody's actually asking parents about their experiences. Nobody's actually asking them how, what strategies they use, what barriers they have found. There have been a few what we call quantitative studies where um, sort of close ended questionnaires are used to um, ask parents about their challenges, but there were no qualitative um, studies which use things like focus groups or interviews to actually directly ask parents about their experiences. So that led to my second research project. And what I um, did here is I interviewed using semi structured interviews. I interviewed 12 parents um, who had children in early intervention, um, and I wanted to find out about their stories, about their experiences, um, what worked for them, what didn't work for them, um, just to gain a little bit more insight from parents, um, because um, having worked in that clinical space, I just have so much seen the untapped resources in parents, and I really, really wanted to delve more into that. So again, what I did was I took these 12 interviews and I 
use thematic analysis to look for patterns and themes and to see, well, what was coming up um, as potential factors from parents of children with hearing loss. And again, I had th three themes. The first theme um, was called Towards Hearing Aids, Journey into the Wilderness. And this kind of encapsulated that time where um, the hearing loss is diagnosed and parents are just dealing with this new diagnosis, trying to juggle multiple appointments, trying to work out how to use hearing aids. And um, it kind of emphasized that um, sometimes the support they receive from professionals um, needs potentially to be different um, and more streamlined and needs to um, me um, include more disciplines all at once so that parents aren't juggling so much. The second theme, adjusting to life with hearing aids, about the journey and not the destination, um, was a theme that encapsulated the new reality that um, parents are facing. They're more into a routine with their children's hearing aids. And here parents provided a lot of tips um, and strategies that they use with their children to improve hearing aids. They also spoke about what were the barriers to keeping the hearing aids in and really just gave me so much insight, um, which kind of informed um, how we could problem solve and what strategies we could use to help children use their hearing aids for more um, of the hours of, of the day when they're awake. The final theme, support for my child's hearing aid use, it's not where you are going, but it's who you have beside you, was a theme that looked at all the different supports that parents have. Um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit later about a child's village, but very much their social supports, the familial ones, professional supports. Um, and, and just to mention too, um, I found that a lot of parents in the study spoke about grandparents and um, that sometimes grandparents were very much on board with hearing aid use, but in other scenarios, um, they weren't at all. Um, another um, great um, theme that came up was around parent to me parent mentoring. Um, and I know, you know, this re really resonates with Aussie Deaf Kids because it's all about how parents help parents as well. And this really came out strongly how much um, parents of children with hearing loss relied on other parents who had kind of walked in their shoes and had experienced some of the difficulties themselves. Okay, so now we've spoken a little bit about the research and I really wanted to use the bulk of the time, which, you know, we've got a good sort of 20 to 25 minutes to talk about the strategic support. What, what can we do, um, you know, based on all this information? What hands-on um, practical advice can I give you today? But before I actually delve specifically into um, different strategies, I did want to say that I know that this cannot be a one size fits all approach. You know your children better than anybody else. You know what strategies will or won't work in your family, um, with your child. And of course, these strategies are also going to be useful at some stages, but not at others on your journey. I also wanted to acknowledge as a general principle that um, when we think about these strategies, they need to be family centered and they need to be around you as a family unit. Of course, your child with hearing loss, but also you as a family unit, because I might come up with a really effective strategy. But if I'm not taking into account how your child fits into your family, what your day looks like, what your listening environments are, who your village, your village is, then I'm not considering, um, you know, the strategies to be family centered enough. The fourth um general principle I wanted to say is that it's really important to link your goals as a parent and a family to your child's device use. So not everyone is going to have the goal of age-appropriate spoken language development and um, 
that might change what device use might look like for your family or the goals around device use, how many hours, where the device is worn, etc. But for those parents who have chosen a spoken language pathway and want age appropriate spoken language for their child and age appropriate listening skills, um, it's really important to have a really strong goal around device use. Um, and that being that the child is wearing the device for um, all waking hours, and that's really the gold standard, or working towards that. Also acknowledging that it's not gonna happen overnight and you might need to um, work this up slowly and incrementally, but having in mind that gold standard that for the development of spoken language, those hearing aids need to be on as much as possible. Right. And then um, the, the last point on the si slide is also the general principle of you shouldn't have to do this alone and um, we need to work collaboratively with you um, to help you reach this goal of, of optimal hearing aid use. And I'll go into a couple of slides later about your child's village and who that is um, so that we can work collaboratively with you. Because as I said, um, you know, when there's poor hearing aid use, it's, it's not only a parent issue, it's all of our issues and we need to work together. The first strategies we're going to chat about is around device care and management. And I just love this quote from one of the participants in my study who um, the mom said, not knowing if they, meaning the hearing aids, are working properly can be stressful. They are working, but they're not working properly. And I just love that quote because it kind of in, encapsulated, um, you know, just what device care is all about. So with that in mind, I wanted us to ask these questions. Are the hearing aids working properly? How are we monitoring this? How are we troubleshooting the hearing aids? And what steps are we taking if the hearing aids are not working? And can we minimize the time that the child has poor access to sound? And that is really, really that I've highlighted in red because it's the most important. Because um, if our child, if our kids with hearing loss have poor access to sound, going back to the theory, they're not going to be able to catch that language during the day. They are not going to be immersed in an environment where they can hear all the rich language around them. So, here are a few tips, and again, I'm sure many of you are already using these, um, but if, if you can take away one new tip from, you know, today's seminar, that will be great as well. So what I'd like to say is the first tip around device care is to, to make it part of your everyday routine, just as much as um, your child's brushing their teeth and having breakfast and getting dressed, make device care part of the routine so that every single day you are checking that the hearing aids are working as best as they can and you're sending your child to school or to daycare or if they're staying at home um, and you can confidently know that the hearing technology is working as best as it could. I might say as a side as well that feel free at any point in time to ask your hearing health professionals, whether they're audiologists, your listening and spoken language specialists, your speech therapist, whoever that, that might be for you, ask them for assistance if you're not sure how to troubleshoot. Um, there are lots of video tutorials. Um, they can do live demonstrations to show you. Um, so really, really important to know how to troubleshoot the hearing aid. Um, most of you should have received a hearing aid toolkit from Hearing Australia. And again, if you need your audiologists to actually show you how to, to use that kit, um, don't feel shy to us. And as I said, lots of video tutorials out there as well. Another important thing as parents and caregivers that we actually know what to look and listen out for. 
And again, ask your hearing health professionals to guide you with this if you need. So do you know how the hearing aid sounds, for example? So um, I know in my study, a lot of parents spoke about that they usually just put the hearing aid in their hand, they cup it and they listen for that whistling and that gives them, you know, a good indication that the hearing aid is working well. But just also knowing what to listen out for. Are there crackles? Is there no sound? Is there an unusual sound? Um, so really knowing what to listen out for and also looking, knowing what to look for. Um, are there cracks in the ear mold? Does something look rusty? Does something look broken? or cracked, really just being in the know that um, something's qu not quite right the way the hearing aid looks or sounds. Very importantly is, do you know your child's behavioral flags when the hearing aids are not working? So again, I heard a lot from the parents in my study that um, children who ask what, what, what all the time or seem less attentive or seem to be mishearing words or might be flat ignoring you, those could be all behavioral signs that the hearing aids are not doing what they usually are meant to do. Another important strategy, very much linked to device use, is the Ling sound test. Um, it's really important that um, you are doing this, you know, each, sorry, I just admitted someone in. It's really important that you are doing the link sound test each and every day um, because it's a quick face valid way for us to determine if something's not quite right. If your child's usually responding really well to the six or seven sounds, and on a particular day they're not, that can indicate, really alert you to the fact that something's qu not quite right with their hearing technology. Um, it's really important, I put there in brackets, to do separate ear testing um, because it's really good to teach uh, test each hearing aid on its own to see if you know the children are responding the way they usually do. Um, I've got a quick little uh, story about that. I was once working with a little boy who um, we first tested his hearing to the, the link set sounds um, using both his devices at the sa same time and all seemed um, fine. But then we did separate ear testing and we realized that his one hearing aid was not actually working. The battery was completely dead in his left hearing aid and his right hearing aid was actually carrying, um, you know, you know, his performance all the time. So really, really important to um, do that separate testing and really looking for patterns as well. The last bit of information on this slide is, you know, what is your plan if the devices are not working? Um, do you have a Hearing Australia close by to you? Do you have a, some spare molds? Is it possible to get a loaner device? It might be possible. Um, or, you know, do you have a wireless communication device or an FM that you can use um, in the one hearing aid that's working well? Because again, just remember, we want children with hearing loss to have optimal access. We don't want them to be without their technology for too long. <laughs> okay, great. So now moving on to um, talking about strategies as they relate to hearing aid retention. And again, I took this quote from one of the parents in my study who said he has been through phases of taking them out all the time, but at the moment he's not, so up and down with that. So here I'm really acknowledging, and especially for those little people um, in the first sort of 12 to 18 months, um, once children discover their hands and discover the uh, um, curiosity of mouthing objects and touching objects and reaching for objects, um, often hearing, hearing aid retention um, is really, really challenging. It also might be that the child is sitting in a high chair or lying on the um, on a mat on the floor um, and the hearing aids are rubbing against these surfaces and they're falling off their ears. So acknowledging that, you know, this can be a challenging time in terms of hearing aid retention. And what I wanted to just get across in this slide is that there are lots of options for hearing aid accessories 
and again work with your hearing health professional your audiologist to work out what um you know might be the best option for um your child um it might be double-sided tape or a pilot cap or a band or some clips again it's very personal and as the quote said it's also um, very much related to the age and stage of your child as well but sometimes just having simple hearing retention options can mean that the hearing aids are staying on for longer um, the next slide um, around strategies is all about parent and caregiver behavioral management and you'll see there actually a couple of slides um, on on this area because you know there are so many um, ways that we can actually improve hearing aid use and again if you could take one tip away from from today that will be great and i'd love to hear your discussion and your tips at the end if i haven't actually mentioned something that's working really really well for you and your family so the first thing I would recommend is keep a diary around your child's hearing aid use. And again, see if you can actually work out if there are patterns. So I found in my first study, and it was mentioned a lot in the second study, that a child's temperament and their physical um, well-being, their physical state, their personality and temperament all played a role in them wearing their hearing aids. So see with the diary, is it a particular time of day when your child's really, really tired or grumpy or hungry? Is it a specific um, listening environment? Is it every time you're going to the park or being in an indoor play area or when your child's in the, in the stroller? Can you pinpoint sometimes we can uh, devise strategies around these patterns that we see in the children? The next, um, you know, advice is what I call anticipatory uh, guidance. And uh, that's not a term that I um, came up with. I've, I came across it in the literature. And it's really about being one step ahead of your child, being aware and being prepared for all those potential barriers. So, um, you know, knowing that your child's going to hit the stage where um, they're going to be interested in mouthing objects and touching objects. So being prepared for that stage, being prepared, for example, if you know your child's going into a noisy environment and that they're going to pull their hearing aids off as soon as they get into that environment and developing strategies around how you can avoid them being pulled out um, all those kind of ways that we can act before it, things actually happen and we can anticipate um, and have some tricks up our sleeve um, the third point there is distractions and um, there are different types of distractions that work with little people to keep those hearing aids in and keep them um, like things like keeping their hands busy and um, one mom suggested every time um, her child you know tried to pull the hearing aids on they'd sing a song music um, reading books really distracting them so that they kind of forget about pulling their hearing aids out um, I really loved one of the parents in, in my study spoke about that she builds hearing aid use around happy experiences and pairing them with hearing aid use. And this can be anything as simple as reading a book together, any bonding time that um, will, you know, just flood happy and positive emotions with your little one and will associate hearing aid use it might be um, you know singing together dinner time um, going on a stroll it might look different for every family but really building hearing aid use paired to happy experiences um, rather than you know it being punitive and don't 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 and you getting stressed and then your child getting stressed and really just trying to build a happier um, atmosphere um, another important behavioral management tip is that of having short breaks. So sometimes when you're hitting your head against the wall and um, your little person is being very feisty and um, not backing down with, you know, pulling the hearing aids off, have a break for a, a while, Re recalibrate, um, calm down a little and then try again. 
um, the another kind of advice is, and very much linked to device care, is you know, make device wear part of your routine. Um, and one of the mums in our study said it's just about a part of getting dressed, and really seeing that you know. Those hearing aids are like the, your socks, like your jumper, et cetera. They are part of who you are. Um, the next um, behavioral management tip is around building your child's hearing aid use incrementally, the hours. And, um, you know, obviously I mentioned it before, our gold standard is all waking hours, but in reality, we know that's not often possible. So just slowly, slowly building up the amount of time that the hearing aids are on. Another very important tip is actually explaining why to your child. And even from a very, very early, early age, if you're using language like, you know, now you can hear Annie's voice or did you hear Elfie barking? Oh, you're wearing your hearing aids and really linking the why to what's happening in their environment. Oh, now you can hear the TV or oh, now you can hear daddy's voice. Um, and you know, children need to understand the why. And when they actually understand the why of hearing aids, they actually will wear them and they will cooperate because they know that our kids are smart and they know they need them and they know they the hearing aids help. And when they actually make that cognitive connection of why, then hearing aid use will improve as well. The next um method you could try is using incentive and reward charts and especially for you know i'd say um late preschool to you know primary school ch children and so on and it doesn't have to be expensive things it doesn't have to be ed edible re reinforcements it can be fun reinforcements like uh you know you get to bake a cake with me or um we'll go for a baby chino together or you know you get um, special one-on-one -on -one time with me. It might be a, a tangible reward, something they can build towards. Um, and especially for those older children, get them involved in actually determining, you know, what the incentive and reward is. Um, the next point is about not getting worked up and making a fuss, which I spoke about a little bit before and giving yourself a break as well, um, because our little people are very clever and they pick up when we're stressed and when we're anxious. Um, and the more we kind of make a fuss for some children, the more they will make a fuss if that's your child and they have that sort of temperament. So again, you know your child child best and um, you know some people will have a very much more laissez-faire approach to hearing aids where they're not making a fuss and not giving much energy to um, you know whether hearing aids are being worn or not and that seems to be effective but then for other parents that might not work. The following points around persistence one of my parents also said this in the study and I just loved it. He said, she said, if XX took his hearing aids out a thousand times, I'd put them back in a thousand times. And again, I just loved that persistence. Um, and I, I, I heard it from a lot of parents that we just keep on persisting because when you know the why of hearing aids and what's at stake, you're going to keep on persisting. Um, the last point on this slide is around consistency from all family members and um, that's within families and for all caregivers involved in you know um, caring for your child it's really really important to have consistent goals with hearing aid use so you know if you have um, you know a policy that the hearing aids are worn all the time around the house um, but then for example, at grandma's house, that's not the that's not you know the goal, or that's what not happen. Again, children are very smart, and they pick up on these inconsistencies, and um, they need us to be consistent for them. Okay, so another area that um you know is would be really a good strategy is to personalize your child's experiences and their hearing aids as well so using social stories or experience books is a fantastic way to boost hearing aid use um again explaining the why in the social stories and um 
you know, taking photos of your kids in, in different, um, during different steps in the day, during different routines. They love being the main character of their stories. And, um, you know, part of who they are is hearing aids are integral to that. Um, giving your hearing aids a name, that's always fun to do. Um, kids like doing that. And it's another positive um, tip around um, personalizing mm -hmm. hearing aid use. I want to say um, that. Some some um, people have, sorry, would everyone mind just muting their mic, if you don't mind, just checking your, fantastic, okay. Uh, another option is to use um, a special hearing aid box. I've actually, in session sessions, made special hearing aid boxes with little people, um, and they love the ownership of that and that sense of control that, oh, it's the end of the day, I can put now, put my hearing aids in my special box, um, and they're going to sleep now, and just that sense of control. Um, I once uh, worked with a little girl who was hiding her hearing aids at preschool, and we made a hearing aid box, and then instead of, even though she was taking her hearing aids off, she was putting them in the hearing aid box instead of at the bottom of the sand pit or somewhere we couldn't find them. Um, so, you know, giving her a sense of control and ownership. Play therapy, you know, making pretend hearing aids, using stickers or Play-Doh um, with um, dolls and fluffy toys. Um, and I know in the market today, I recently saw Lego has come out with um, little figurines that wear hearing aids and cochlear implants um, and they're little dolls and but you can even make your own um, just so that you know from an early early on age children are seeing um, you playing with with dolls who also wear hearing aids and I know that certainly helped um, in my therapy sessions to um, you know make the dolls etc wear hearing aids as well there are a lot of fun accessories out there that children um, might like to wear on their hearing aids, hearing aid earrings or stickers or whatnot. There are also really a lot of special books out there around children wearing hearing aids. And if you just go Google, you know, um, books for children and hearing loss, you'll see there's so many different um, books about them. So just making it part of their reality and their experience. The strategies, the next type of strategies I want to talk about is self-advocacy. And it's never, ever, ever too early to start with self-advocacy around hearing aids with your kids. And um, you might actually try doing um, a little bit of what I call, um, you know, playful sabotage at home, where you actually, on purpose, take out the child's um, battery in one of their hearing aids or both their hearing aids and just for a short amount of time where we try and actually start building up the sense of self-advocacy where the children are pointing to their devices and saying they're not working obviously when they have the language to do so. Um, obviously I wouldn't advise it for long periods of time because we don't want our children to be off air but you know just to start building in that self-advocacy really really early. Um, another ad, a, a great thing to do is um, to advise children at preschool or at a daycare and beyond to start doing show and tell with all their buddies and um, showing, showing them how the devices work. Um, and we can help script this. You can, as a parent or as therapist, we can do it in the session where we can actually help your children script what they want to say, you know, and... Um, you know, it's a great way of the, them sharing the pride of their devices and being um, their own little advocates. Um, let children, when they're old enough, to actually set goals and incentives, especially when it comes to hearing aid use. As I said before, like if you're using incentive charts, um, you know, what are they working towards if they're building their hearing aid use hours to an extra two hours a day? What does that look like in terms of their incentives and rewards, etc.? Um, I once worked with a little boy who wore his hearing aids all the time at school, but didn't wear them at, at home at all. And it was really important for us that he 
you know, was wearing them in all, all situations because children are learning all the time. Every environment is a learning environment. And we actually got him involved in setting goals for himself of how he could build that up. And it started with, oh, I'm going to wear it for every time, you know, I'm playing a game with my brother or when I'm with mum at the dinner table, et cetera, and slowly building up incrementally how much time he was wearing it at home. And it was, it really worked. It was quite successful. Um, another one around self-advocacy is modeling and encouraging communication repair strategies. And um, let's model to our children right from the beginning um, so that they can learn to be aware of things that they can control in their environment. Because if it's a very, very noisy environment, for example, or the message isn't clear or is too soft or too loud, it's going to be a deet, uh, it's going to be something that the child will use to take off their devices because they won't tolerate the devices if they're in, it, things sound too noisy or, or unclear or too soft. So it's, let's start using communication repair strategies like, you know, let's tell, um, you know, X to make the music softer so that it's not so loud and you can hear nicely or, you know, let's tell Y to come a little bit closer so that we can hear him nicely or to speak a bit louder or softer and start using that language and modeling that language so that your children actually build those communication repair strategies as well. Um, the last point around self-advocacy is also um, enlist the help of a buddy, especially when your child's at pre from preschool and beyond, you know, someone who actually also takes pride in the hearing device and is reminding you about your hearing device, like have you put them away when it's sleep time at preschool or if a child's using a, an FM de device paired with their hearing aids, you know, did you remember to switch it on or did you remember to um, plug it in the charger, et cetera. Um, and I've got a really cute story again, a little boy I work with, um, he had a buddy at school and it was so successful that the buddy who doesn't have a hearing loss wanted hearing aids, which, um, you know, it, it was really successful in building a, an awareness and pride around wearing those hearing aids. Okay, very important. The strategy around working with the child's village and uh, this is really, really a, an important message that um, we know the, the famous saying, it takes a village to raise a child. And as parents, you need to assess who is your child's village. And it's anyone your child is spending um, a significant amount of time with. It's educators, it's therapists, family members, um, both immediate families and more extended family members. It's anyone in your community who's involved in, in raising your child. And um, we need to involve them and get them on board with hearing aid use. We need to explain to them the why of hearing aids, just like we explain the why of hearing aids to children. We need to explain to them what's at stake if they're not on the child's ears. If your child's spending a large amount of time in educational settings, then we need to show them how to do basic troubleshooting in case the hearing aids um, stop working or are, are not working optimally while the child's at preschool, at school, etc. Et uh, again, going back to that point that was on another side, consistency is key. You know, you know what's happening at home with wearing the hearing aids needs to happen in every other environment that the child child is spending time in because every environment is a learning environment, not only an educational one. And coming back to that 80% of language is caught and not taught. Children are picking up language here, there and everywhere, in the park, at school, in the supermarket, you name it, they're picking it up. Very importantly, um, reducing the concerns and worries to your other, the child's village about their hearing aids. It came up a lot in this, um, in my study that often teachers were concerned about hearing aids being choking hazards and the safety of the hearing aids. They worried about they were hurting the child when they were putting the molds in or um, they're easy to break. We need to really break down some of those myths around hearing aids. Um, again, I've said this again, but 
really co collaborate and problem solve with your hearing health team. You're not in this alone. And if you're having difficulties with hearing aid use, involve everyone. It's for everyone to try and solve. We're all here to support you and really, really lean on us. Um, the most important important people in your um, village are other parents whose children have hearing loss and um, they have so much experience and knowledge and they are this untapped res un resource that you know we need to really tap into and this was a huge theme that came out in both my research studies about just the power and power of parent mentoring um, to talk to someone who's been in the same boat as you and has these fabulous strategies and has this fabulous advice, you know, um, is, is actually priceless. And the last point on this slide is practical and emotional support. Um, you're going to have, you know, some really lousy days and um, you not only need practical support around hearing aid use, you also need emotional support and um, that's okay. You need to lean on us as much as everyone leans on you, you need to lean on us as well. And, um, you know, sometimes just having a session, uh, you know, with your hearing health professional, telling her your concerns, what's worrying you, um, and, you know, really coming to solve solutions together. Teamwork is so important within and between teams. So if your child's attending a specific early intervention center, it's important that everyone's on the same page within this early intervention center and between other um, stakeholders. Um, everyone should be giving you the same messages about your child's hearing aid use. If someone's telling you all waking hours and somebody else is telling you, oh no, only when the child's at school, that's not good enough because that's conflicting and it's and actually going to make you feel more conflicted. So really ensuring that we as your hearing health professionals are giving you the same advice that's not conflicting. Um, sharing listening and communication strategies with your educators and any children, any caregivers that your children are spending time with. That can also help hearing aid use. So for example, balancing heavy listening tasks with less demanding ones, that might be the trick that actually keeps those hearing aids on for longer, giving your children rest time during the, the day where they can maybe read a book in the corner and just have some quiet time. Um, that might be another trick that will get them wearing their hearing aids for as much as possible. I've spoken about parent-to-parent -parent mentoring and it can happen in so many different forms. It doesn't need to be formal. It can be organic, it can be in any context. It can be online. It can be a telephone call, meeting someone informally. Um, you know, the one mum told me in my in her interview that she met another parent in the waiting room and she was getting this amazing informal mentoring in the waiting room with another parent important invite caregivers to therapy sessions and involve them in goal setting the ieps or ifsps and make optimal hearing aid use a goal if you have other goals around age appropriate spoken language development um, and finally, the last point around working in the village is educate others who might not be involved with your children on a regular basis, but um, sometimes just giving them information um, might actually make things so much clearer and will prevent them from doing things um, again and again. So, for example, if you're frequently going to a restaurant um, and the music is really, really loud in the background. Actually, just chatting to the restaurant owner and explaining why, you know, having pounding music in the background is not only not a good idea for your child with hearing loss, but for everybody who's sitting there. Um, you know, just making people aware of um, hearing loss and um, the importance of your child being having having optimal access to sound. Um, that really brings me to the end, and I apologize, I went over a little bit. So with regard to using 
what we call wireless communication devices or an F or FM systems, it's really, really important that um, the person who's using it, which is usually the teacher, is very uh, well aware of how to use it and when to use it. And it's not always going to be appropriate to have the FM on all the time for all the listening hours of the day, especially in preschool when you might actually say, well, for any group related tasks during storytelling, um, you know, when um, you know, you're together as a group, you might have the FM on, but then say if the child's at a set, different station, they're l different play stations, then you wouldn't necessarily have the, the FM on all the time. So I think that needs to be um, communicated with the educator, you know, you know, when the FM should be used, because to have the FM on all the time is not necessarily helpful for the child, especially say, for example, the child's at the Play-Doh station and the teacher is at the pretend play station. The child doesn't need to hear what's going on in the pretend play station if they're at the Play-Doh station. Do you see what I'm saying? They And sometimes the FM, the use of it, um, really, really needs to be monitored. We don't want the teacher's microphone to be on all the time. She needs to know when to mute it because sometimes it's not appropriate for it to be to be on. So um, it definitely helps um, with the clarity of the signal because you're overcoming distance and noise, and essentially you're putting the signal, which is usually the parent, the teacher talking right into your child's device. So it's an excellent, um, it's excellent to use FMs, but like any technology, if they're not used pro properly, they can be detrimental as well. So she would be spending a lot of um, listening time in more of a, a teaching forum and less play teaching. So the the device would the FM would need to be on for all the times that the teacher was um, you know teaching and that might range for when the child goes to different classes like art or um, sport and I think that needs to be agreed with um, with the teacher and I think th that's where there needs to be communication with the parents and the teacher around which scenarios. The, the FM is used when it's not used. So, for example, that it's turned off during research, recess and um, play break, um, and that it's efficiently used. And then giving both the, the teacher and the child ownership. So, this is where self advocacy comes in. You know, um, you know, I know kids in the past who actually have leave their FM at school to charge overnight, for example, if they're only using the FM at school. Um, so, you know, having a buddy or, or the child having that self-advocacy at the end of the day to put the the FM in the charger, or it might be that the child's using the FM at home as well, then they need to put it in the bag at the end of the day. Another thing with teachers with FMs, it's sometimes lovely for children and the teachers to have like almost like a secret code um, that is less, if I can say, embarrassing for the child, especially in those later years and teenagers where teenagers don't want everyone knowing that the teacher's wearing an FM, where they almost develop like, you know, touch no signal to, to tell the teacher to switch on the FM because she's got it muted, for example. Um, so having that a secret code, or again having a buddy, a, a buddy getting involved with the child, um, who's an extra person who can make sure that the teacher's got it on as well. So I think the conditions for using it will differ from child to child, school environment to school environment, but there needs to be a communication piece where. Um, these things are all agreed upon um, between the teacher and the child and their parents. And it obviously will differ from, from child to child.